uh, uh, graduate center CUNY and is teaching at the BMCC. And uh, also in part of her studies is looking at dramaturgs, the young emerging dramaturg who also monitors the scene. And then, of course, our uh, executive officer, Peter Eckersall, who is um, uh, not only monitoring the scene, but part of the dramaturgical uh, uh, um, world, especially in Europe, but also in Asian and Japanese theater, but really has from his own work practice uh, a real experience, but also is very much involved in uh, dramaturgy as a contemporary um, form of uh, um, of uh, looking at theater through the lenses of uh, something that's perhaps closer to theory, you know, than just the practice. And I think uh, it is a great, uh, great uh, contribution. So all three of you, thank you for having, for t taking the time out of your lives to fly over, come here, Bertie, and of course, um, also Peter. So the format of the evening will be both, uh, all three of them will give a presentation between 10 to 15 minutes, closer to 15, of course, um, with some slides, then we will have a discussion or they will talk to each other and we open it up uh, fairly um, right away and I think really is a very, very uh, great moment to have some insights uh, into uh, contemporary thinking about dramaturgy and it happens very rarely and we are thrilled that we are able to, to do this. It's also live streamed. We have a microphone for the questions at the end and um, I think we start um, with our uh, guest uh, uh, of honor, Catalin, and we, we use this and is it, Mike, should we move it a little bit closer here? Yeah. yeah. And um, it makes it a bit easier because we also have some size. So again, thank you so much. If you have a cell phone, uh, please do take it out. I'll do it too and see if it's off. It never rings in our uh, evenings. It's really true. And we will also have a small reception uh, afterwards here. So in case you have additional questions or uh, something you couldn't ask didn't, or didn't want to ask. So um, here we go. So thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah? Um. Frank mentioned the uh, Showbühne, so I will pick it up from there. And uh, the legendary dramaturg of the Showbühne, uh, Dieter Sturm, uh, was recently interviewed. And in this interview, he he was asked about uh, the uh, dramaturgy and his role as a dramaturg. And he said that, in his opinion, the dramaturg is responsible for the igniting moment between three elements, text, actor, and director. And I really like this idea of inflammation, igniting moment that he talked about, because it, it is very similar to other descriptions uh, other people use when talking about the nature of the role. Some people describe it as the catalyst, others uh, as a facilitator. And uh, basically, all of them are talking about collaboration uh, and good leadership, where the decision is made as, uh, by a consensus. And uh, this book, can I have the next slide, please? slide. Oops. Uh, this book, Dramaturgy in the Making, in a way, is my journey, too. Uh, I was born and raised in Hungary, and I studied dramaturgy there. And because uh, the Hungarian theater system is very similar uh, to the German one, it inherited the German theater and uh, uh, culture uh, theater system. Uh, I never questioned my role as a dramaturg I, uh, or m the necessity of my work until I went to uh, the United Kingdom in the 1990s. To okay, yeah? Is that? Okay. Is it better? Okay. Can you hear me better? I'm just going to hold it. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, and I don't think we need this between you and us. <laughs> so that's just a dramaturgy of space. Yeah. Okay, so, so it never occurred to me to question my, my role as a dramaturg or my necessity until I went to England to do my traineeship, and I did it at one of the most prestigious theatre schools. And on day one, I was told that dramaturgy doesn't exist in the UK. 
what? What are you talking about? So my book is, uh, is part of this quest, um, uh, or this journey uh, about dramaturgy. It is certainly true that when I arrived or landed in Britain in the 90s, uh, the role was still not settled there because uh, it started only in the 1960s. And uh, when I arrived, there was a very exciting and interesting dialogue about uh, dramaturgy. Uh, and, uh, the profession was still fresh, and it was encouraged by fairly recent publications on the subject by Mary Luckhurst, Kathy Turner, and Sina Burnt. So this new discourse, it, set, it tried to settle the term dramaturgy within British theatre practices at the same time that fairly new areas of theorization of the field, new practices and new terms uh, left their mark on it. In this, I saw an opportunity for dramaturgy to rethink and revise its terms and practices um, in the context of contemporary theater and performance and perhaps rejuvenate itself. I also wanted to shift away from the question of what is a dramaturg and ha uh, to how does a dramaturg operate? And how is dramaturgy done? What to do? What, uh, what do we need to do in our uh, What do we need in our dramaturgical toolbox? If dramaturgy is indeed a craft and perhaps an art, surely there must be certain methods, skills, and proficiencies to be learned in order to do it well to be a good enough dramaturg. The motto of my book comes from an American theorist and dramaturg and a dear friend, Jeff Pearl, uh, who also wrote the introduction to my book. Those of us working in the field need to continually describe ways of working as seriously and carefully as possible, as if the future of the discipline depended on them. If there's one thing I want to emphasize uh, about the way my book approaches dramaturgy, is that doing dramaturgy is an active, not a passive thing. And this is what the cover image, which is depicting Akram Khan performing uh, Dash, uh, this is one of the case studies I use in the book. This is what the cover image is trying to express. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, it took me seven years to research and write this book. And as a byproduct, <laughs> I, I edited another book with Bernadette Cochran, New Dramaturgy, International Perspectives on Theory and Practice. And it's, uh, this book examines theory and practice of dramaturgy in our ever-expanding theatrical universe. Um, next slide, please. Uh, dramaturgy in the making uh, consists of three parts. And uh, for the purpose of research, I marked the territory of dramaturgy into three distinct strands. Institutional dramaturgy, production dramaturgy, and new dramaturgy. And from each strand, I selected leading professionals, uh, 50 professionals from Europe and North America, working mainly for not-for-profit theaters and companies, and interviewed them about one recent dramaturgical work they had been involved in scrutinizing their dramaturgical processes throughout the various stages of the work. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, for this... Uh, uh, for the description of their work and, and, and these case studies, I used uh, the ideas of an American dramaturg, Mira Rafalovitz, who in a very beautiful essay describes her work as a dramaturg. And uh, the main thought of, of her essay is that during a creative process, we ask uh, questions. And uh, as our questions change, these changing questions mark uh, different stages of the creative process. So I could use this scheme in order to examine the creative processes, the case studies I collected, and I could compare them. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So part one of uh, Dramaturgy in the Making discusses institutional dramaturgy, the work of dramaturgs, literary managers, artistic associates based at an organization, let it be a theater, a company, or a festival. This is where the profession started with Lessing, and at its core is repertoire planning and new drama development. So in, in oh, fantastic, you can hear me now. Uh, chapter one gives a brief historical and aesthetic overview of institutional dramaturgy. It examines the formation of national theaters and shows that the role of the dramaturg comes with progressive changes. 
in the way we make theatre, particularly a people's theatre, especially a national theatre. Chapter two through concrete examples, including the National Theatre London, the Schaubühne Berlin, the Royal Flemish Theatre Brussels, and the Stratford Festival Canada. It discusses the curatorial role of institutional dramaturgs. Chapter three takes two case studies, one from the Royal Court Theatre and the other from the National Theatre London. And it discusses the dramaturg's facilitating role when working on a play in translation. And chapter four, it's uh, via several case studies, follows the work of dramaturgs in new drama development, when starting from scratch, when working with a pre-existing first draft, when working with an established playwright, and when working with several playwrights simultaneously in a retreat environment. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, from this part of the book, I just want to show you one quick example uh, on new drama development. Uh, Shoot, Get, Treasure, Repeat, that was a play cycle written by Mark Ravenhill. And uh, what connects these plays is that they all explore the theme of war. And uh, the company who had Mark Ravenhill to develop this cycle, when staging the plays, they were thinking what to do with them. At the same time, uh, the British artist Anthony Gormley had an exhibition of his uh, sculptures, The Watchers, and these statues were displayed on various landmark objects, uh, landmark buildings all over in London. And that gave uh, the theatre company an idea that perhaps they can scatter similarly the Mark Ravenhill plays in London the way Mar uh, Anthony Gormley's um, statues were scattered. So in a three weeks period, you could, within a three weeks period, you could see these plays. Some of them were played at the Royal Court Theatre, some of them at the National. Some of them you could listen through headphones on a street. Some of them um, were live uh, broadcast on BBC radio. Some of them you could see uh, in a hotel room and, and, and another was uh, played uh, in a bus stop. So that's very interesting dramaturgy, in my opinion. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, part two of my book discusses production dramaturgy, and it starts with a brief historical overview of production dramaturgy and the formation of the role. And it shows how the role of the uh, production dramaturg evolved hand in hand with the role of the director. And uh, the next chapter, uh, through two case studies, uh, the Tanakhab Amsterdam and the Josef Attila Theatre Budapest, and various other dramaturgs' comments, shows the production dramaturgs' work in text based theatre. And uh, chapter seven shows the dramaturgy of devised uh, theatre, the role of the production dramaturg when working on a devised production. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I just wanted to show you an image from one of the case studies I use in the production dramaturgy part, and it's uh, the Roman tragedies uh, uh, by the Tanakh of Amsterdam, directed by Ivo van Hoof. What is very exciting about this production uh, is that it's three uh, plays by Shakespeare, uh, Coriolanus, uh, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra, woven together into one continuous performance. And uh, this five and a half hour long performance is without an interval, and the audience is situated in the middle of a political colloquium. And the, this marathon performance is exploring the world of politics. The other exciting thing about this production that you can see over there, it says five minutes until the death of Coriolanus. Basically what they did uh, was that they incorporated the production notes, the program notes in the performance as subtitles. So you, could, you, you got explanation, you got footnotes, you got some warning, like uh, in a Shakespeare play in the prologue, you hear about uh, the, the plot. Here you, you could time or, or get back from, uh, from uh, wherever you wanted to wander during the performance in time to see Coriolanus' death. Uh, so that was a very interesting thing and a very, very exciting dramaturgy. By the way, three dramaturgs worked on this production. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? 
part three of the book uh, explores dance dramaturgy. And uh, I was very proud that, as far as I know, before my book, dance dramaturgy wasn't included uh, in, in this discourse. Uh, luckily, these days, there are many more books uh, exploring dance dramaturgy. Uh, so part three uh, discusses dance dramaturgy, which is the most dynamically evolving strand of new dramaturgy. Uh, in chap chapter eight, follows through the history of dramaturgical thinking in dance from Lucien to the 20th century. And I just wanted to show that uh, dance dramaturgy was thought about and discussed before there was even a word to describe it. So when we, when we talk about uh, the development of dramaturgy uh, in, in theatre, we are really struggling how to link Lessing with Brecht. You don't have to struggle when you talk about dance dramaturgy. It's really, really exciting. Uh, chapter nine examines the history of the profession of the role uh, of the dance dramaturg, beginning around the time that the previous chapter left it. Uh, the first dance dramaturg was Raymond Hoge, who worked for the Tanztheater Wuppertal with Pina Bausch. And this is how the afternoon screening is linked to, to this evening's talk. Um, because Pina Bausch was championing uh, a method whereby she was asking questions from her dancers and, and uh, they build the performance together uh, uh, with, with her performers. And uh, the second film that we saw uh, this evening, oh, sorry, the third film that we saw this evening was about Les Ballets, uh, C'est de la Baie. Uh, and Alain Platel fo uh, is following in the footsteps of, of Pina Bausch. He's using a very similar method and one of the case studies that can be found in the 10th chapter uh, is from Les Ballets de la Baie Gant. In fact, it was the out of context uh, for Pina production. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so that's the Tante Theater Wuppertal, and this is uh, Les Ballets de la Baie performing uh, a production that was uh, dedicated to Pina Bausch because it was created uh, it was, uh, they were rehearsing it when, th when they heard about her untimely death. And this is a production which is still on the repertoire. So every year the dancers return to Ghent to perform one more time the show. So they are maturing and aging together with the performance. And this is again very much like what Pina Bash used to do, that her dancers matured and aged together with the performance and, and paid, uh, performed it for a very, very long time. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is just a beautiful quote from Alain Platel uh, I, I, I wanted to share with you, uh, uh, where he says that he, he never makes m dances. I just work with the material. The mat material is not a written text or a book. I work with the material that I see, then I just place them and play with them. I like to work with people who like to move. And in that sense, people call me a choreographer. But whether it is a theater or dance or opera, this is really not something I'm thinking of. This is also a question Pina Bausch raised 50 years ago, that performances are all these things together. I don't make any distinctions anymore. Can I have the next slide, please? This is just an excerpt from uh, uh, out of context, and this is uh, a similar exploration of those kind of band movements of dyskinesia that we could also watch in, in, the, in the production of Label A.C. de la Bay. So they are venturing into uh, movements that are kind of taboo for the stage, and the, uh, through these movements they are exploring something about human nature. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so to conclude, um, I think a couple of years ago there was here another book launch about books dealing with new dramaturgy and one of the editors, uh, Magda Romanska, who in, in that very same book about dramaturgy, the, the right lit companion, companion to dramaturgy, she quoted that if the 20th century can be called the century of the author director, the 21st century will be the century of the dramaturg. I, I'd like to 
kind of slightly modify this very, very bold prediction and say that perhaps the 21st century can be the century of dramaturgy because it is certainly true that we think about dramaturgical processes when we, uh, and, and there's a huge attention that is given to dramaturgy and dramaturgical processes. And there's a higher emphasis than ever on dramaturgy, the weaving together of the material that will constitute the texture of the performance. Can I have the next slide, please? So the new dramaturg's role is very beautifully um, summarized by Sandra Nerth. It means opening up a divided, usually temporary space of negotiation and the creation and reflection of the evolving act of tracking the diverse traces of what is emerging. It does not mean not making decisions. It is much rather about the shouldering of responsibility with respect to the politics of decision making. Can I have the next slide, please? And uh, this is an image I'd like to share with you. I would have loved to use this for my cover of the book, but sadly I didn't get the rights. This is Francis Ice's tornado, and you can see the artist running headlong into the tornado there. And one of my interviewees, uh, Ruth Little, who works with Af Akram Khan as her dramaturg, this is how she described her work, that this is like running headlong into this organic, chaotic, beautiful thing. Um, and I'd just like to close with, with a thought from Marianne van Kerkhoven. She's another very important person. Uh, she coined the word, the new dramaturgy, a word we'll hear a lot about. And uh, this is a quote from her, dramaturgy is for me learning how to handle complexity. Um, if we'll have time at the end of this session, I, I Perhaps we read a short excerpt from the book, but I think it's a good time to hand it over to Bertie and Peter and he hear how they would want to handle complexity. Coming. Thank you, Frank and Peter, for hosting. Thanks, Catalin, for, for your thoughts. So I was asked to um, kind of uh, provide some thoughts in reaction to her book. Um, I have to tell you, I'm actually not a dramaturg, and I was definitely not trained as a professional dramaturg, but I've come out of it um, thinking about dramaturgy, because as you say, it's the new 21st century thing to do. So. Um, can we have the, the first slide? Um, so my interest in um, dramaturgy arose from research that I did in, uh, for, actually I've been researching performance that don't quite, um, that are not text-based text -based for a while, um, and that kind of use the theater in, in ways that producers, presenters, and curators are not used to using, you know, you don't, you don't go, you know. Um, it's much better. Um, so, so researching those performances, I started to look at the people who were, who had to book those and commission them, and therefore it led me to the curators. The their, you can call them presenters, artistic directors, and I, I also there was kind of a trend twenty years ago starting that had contemporary theater festivals. Then they took out the word theater. So it was contemporary performance festivals, and they had a range. Um, so with Tom Seller, who, uh, who's editor of theater, we, we uh, edited a special issue. Um, it's for the fall of 2014, where we interviewed a number of these emerging curators. One of them is here, sitting here, Norm Frisch. And, and, and really, what, what that showed me is that there was a dramaturgy in curation that I hadn't been thinking about. Of course, I hadn't been thinking about dramaturgy at all till now, really, I mean, a few, um, till I met Peter, um, about how curating works. And so for that issue, um, which again is fall, it's, it's called Performance Curators, I wrote about the emergence of the performance curator in the 21st century, in particular for the performing arts, um, from content to context. 
So how it went, kind of a historical um, looking back at how really the role of the curator of performing arts, first of all, was never called a curator. There's still today, there's different names for him or her. Um, and started with kind of a selecting shows, commissioning, traveling abroad, just picking shows, um, to context. In other words, conceptualizing how a performance is even to be presented, and, I, and you mentioned this in your book, it's not just what the artist does in the space, but it's how it's presented from, do you have a box office, do you don't, how, how, you know, what time of night, all that is dramaturgy, is it presented throughout three weeks, throughout, I mean, we know this, so. So, so um, among the curators we interviewed, it, it was Norm Frisch, um, we had people like Matthias Lilenthal, Judy Husey Taylor, Joanna Warsaw, Lola Arias, and Helen Cole, among others. And the questions we were asking are what are practices that they implement? Um, what presentational forms do they implement? How do they conceive of, I mean, seasons is a bad word, but how are they conceiving? How are they even thinking through, the, through these, um, th about how do they present these artists? So um, I noticed that, um, again, not only were they selecting performances to fill a season, but they were questioning the ways to present um, as much as artists are doing. Um, and they were um, <clears throat> questioning how to present performance in a new way or as the artist was, was demanding. So the first, I'm just gonna bring a couple of examples so you see what I'm talking about. Um, the, the first is Lola Arias and Stefan Kaegi of Rimini Protocol. They got together and uh, conceived of a festival called Ciudades Paralelas, uh, Parallel Cities, where they commissioned eight artists to create, that of course they love, to create a performance tailored for a functional location. Functional by that meaning um, that was quote unquote real, it had to take place in the world, and the performance could not intervene with that reality. So if you have something in a factory, for example, they couldn't stop making the cars. Um, if you have, um, of course in a hotel, you're not gonna have people, but it was a working hotel, and that kind of provided logistical constraints, for example, when they went to India. So, um, can I have the next slide? So they did, uh, I'm just going to make the artists all correct. Uh, okay, so Dominique Hubert, who's here for Hotel Savoy, maybe some of you saw this for PS 122, uh, they commissioned him to do the one in the building. Next. Can we have the next slide? They commissioned, oh, so Stefan Kaegi did one in a building where actually you, you're led by, I didn't see this one, but Lola explained to me, you, you, a blind man kind of takes you up to the roof, so you're in the roof of this building listening to stories and looking out. The next one. And this is all part of one festival. Uh, the next one is, to, no, I'm sorry, go back. Oh yeah, so this is the quiet volume that took place in libraries and it was created by Tim Mitchells in Ann Hampton. Came to New York, actually. Next. Um, actually, go back, because I, I just want to share what that one was quickly. So for this one, you arrived to a library, and you were given just uh, headphones, and then you were told to go to a place of study, right? And it was kind of time. So at the same time, you sat with one other person, but you didn't quite know who else in this audience was studying or perhaps listening to headphones. A lot of people now listen to headphones. So you were, as you kind of read books and engaged with the performance of reading and, and a person speaking to you through the headphones and listening to a kind of story, that was the performance. So people could still study, people could still do what they had to do, and yet you were kind of this huge experience where you didn't quite know who was an audience, who wasn't, et cetera. This took place, this was in the Palacio de Justicia in Buenos Aires, but it, again, it took place outside of courts, and this was Christian Garcia. And finally, this one was Hotel Maids by Lola Arias, where she, and I think the next one is also 
hers, yeah, where um, she interviewed and, and talked about the people who were the the people who were basically cleaning the rooms and the and the labor, um, the invisible labor that that tends to take place in hotels. And so she she interviewed them, and then you would go to hotels and then kind of find out about their lives and what they had done to clean the room, etc. So. Um, I interviewed Lola about this, as you know, her work as an artist and, and curator and how she was thinking, and she told me that the pieces were genuinely portable in the sense that the only thing we were transporting were concepts. The concept of for each piece will be fully developed, and each piece will be restaged in the context of each city with different performers, different spaces, and so on. The only person traveling was the artist and his or her idea recontextualize at every site. So in other words, and again, I hadn't been thinking about dramaturgy at all, but what's really coming out is this new kind of, this new form of dramaturgy for, for curating and performance practices. Um, so it, it, Ciudades Paralelas, the festival, really emerged as an alternative model for live art touring, rather than this kind of season or even festival of new work framework. Um, <clears throat> oh, one more thing that uh, especially she had in mind was this notion of portable concepts. So you were also economically sustainable. You're not kind of touring this huge, massive set that's very expensive. And you're also hiring um, actors at, at, at every site locally. So you're really engaging um, at, at the very local level in context um, through these performance pieces. OK, so the next example was, is yeah, so Helen Cole, uh, she used to she used to be curator for Arnolfini, which is more of a visual arts center. But she was head of live arts there, and she <clears throat> before as she was she had worked there for a long time. And when she was leaving, she wanted to kind of create an archive of all the amazing performances that very few people got to see. And it, what started as a really small archival program uh, for her, which was that she got, she got audience members who would talk to her about um, the feelings they had when they watched a the performance. And these were performances she knew had been good, like Blast Theory or Wooster Group or some of these kind of canonical um, artists. She, she recorded them. And as she was kind of archiving this, she discovered that, wow, these she went back to that performance, the memory, and people kind of got moved rethinking these. So again, what began, what began as an archival project for the love of this ephemeral form, with her practice of curating became a kind of, you can call it what it is, kind of installation, somewhat performance. So what she created was, it eventually became We See Fireworks, which is all these, you go in and you listen Oh, obviously, they're carefully selected. It's in the dark. They have a set, you know, kind of volume that she's put into them. And the light bulbs represent a different memory. And what happened was that as, as she toured this, she created this space where people wanted to talk about a, a performance memory. And so after you, you experience this, then you get in a room and you share your own memory of something. And she says that, I mean, it's like up to 800 and above now, but she's, you know, she'll edit, of course, curate dramaturgically, um, uh, whatever word you want to choose for, for the performance to kind of have what she calls this theatrical quality. And she never called herself an artist before this, um, but she, she, she says that this is part of curation. And again, going back to the new dramaturgy, this was not a word that came up in the interview at the time when I, you know, I did the interview or that she said, but now it just seems dramaturgical. And this is what she, what she says about this. When I started the 20 audio pieces, I created a very small installation that was just between uh, six and seven minutes. And because I realized in experimenting that it's quite hard to listen to these intense personal recollections without something to focus on, I began to play with the theatricality of these texts. I put them in a dark space, and I created an installation using vintage light bulbs that came on uh, and off as the recordings were played. So it almost felt like these light bulbs were characters, or mini performers almost, playing in the darkness. Now again, remember that these are memories of actual performances. So sometimes, and she, she noted in the interview that 
um, one of the performers of, I think it was Back to Back, uh, went there and didn't realize that they were actually talking about a performance that they had done. So again, it's a, it's a kind of an archival um, memory. So can I have one thing? I'll, okay. And so th this was not included in the, um, the, the theater journal piece, but this is, uh, again, I think, kind of this new dramaturgical way of curation. Um, this, this is a new trend in these experiential museums now. This one's called the Empathy Museum. And they did a piece at the Lyft Festival in 2016 called A Mile in My Shoes, where what they wanted was to tape mem uh, <laughs> stories from people, and you literally walk in their shoes. So they're, again, similar to Quiet Bond, there's no actor, you're the actor spectator, and you go and you, into this kind of small house, and you walk in, and you choose the shoes you want to wear, you put them on, and you put the recording that, and then you literally walk in their shoes, and you listen to the stories. So again, another kind of dramaturgy curating example. And, and the creator, by the way, is an artist curator, and, uh, although, we can call them a dramaturg or, or not, you know. Okay, so all of this, can I have? All right, okay. So all of this to conclude that this is kind of where I'm at and this led me to, uh, look, I became fascinated by the fact that now we have so much performance in museums and, and visual art spaces and I was wondering now, hmm, so these people are actually called curators and I wonder if they're using dramaturgy. So the, 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 the dramaturgical thinking is kind of the new, um, the thing I want to take on now to look at how performance is being utilized and curated in museums are actually using that term, whereas in, in theater, um, again, before some of these people didn't call themselves curators. And so these are just some of the performances um, we've seen at MoMA recently. Can we have one more? So this was Mary Hassabi's Plastic, photo Peter Eccleso, thank you. <laughs> um, and this one, and this is where a good ending, because this is where I'm gonna go. We can talk about it later. What's the role of dramaturgy in museum curation and how can we think about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both to Bertie and Catalin. And, and um, just to begin, I'd like to really thank Catalin for her work on dramaturgy because those of us who work in dramaturgy and go to conferences about dramaturgy end up in situations where people who are new to the field constantly talk about, oh, we need to define the term. And, uh, and you just waste days doing this. And, and now we can just say, okay, go and read Catalin's book. It does it all. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for the work that you've done on, on this. It's, it's so important, I think, to, to our field. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about New Media Dramaturgy. This is also a book publication that uh, is very recent, uh, it, uh, authored by myself, Helena Grahan, and Edward Shear. But um, the beginnings of this project are questions that we ask, what happens when words end in theatre, when they run out of steam in a sense? So we're seeing a lot of theatre now, I think, and performance where uh, playwrights, not, not performance makers in a more avant-garde sense or experimental sense, are seemingly mistrusting their own words. And, and we have a play that three quarters of the way through shifts its register from dramatic text into performance and we have some kind of uh, affective experience, some kind of immersive environment, some kind of transformation of the stage uh, seems to unfold. And the register of the, of the performance changes. We're no longer uh, listening to some kind of dramatic story unfold, some kind of narrative function that is expressed through the text. And instead, um, an audience is, is shifting their, their register to seeing atmospheres appear on stage. And I think this is really interesting. It's really challenging, it's really questioning. I'm wondering, one, why this is, is taking place also in, in, in political terms. I think it's a very interesting question. But also, what happens to the, to the play form? What happens to dramaturgy? How do we talk about a dramaturgy of things, a dramaturgy of objects, a dramaturgy of atmosphere, smoke? light, sound, and so on and so forth. And that's something that this book 
addresses in, uh, hopefully in some detail. Next slide, please. Um, also, at the beginning of this point, we all must uh, citationally quote Marianne van Kirkhoven, who uh, is a very important figure in the world of uh, contemporary dramaturgy. Um, she, as far as I'm aware, asked the fir first asked the question, is there a dramaturgy of things? Can we talk about a dramaturgy of lighting, sound, space, movement, and so on and so forth? And really planting the seed for this idea of a much more complex framework for dramaturgy that talks about the experience of the whole stage as it unfolds. So um, I think that's a very important uh, acknowledgement of somebody who is really thinking about the work uh, already as this idea of a new, a new form of dramaturgy invoking atmospheres, objects and forms uh, was unfolding. Next slide, please. Much of this appeared, uh, I think, in, at least in one case study, we can look at the appearance of this in the development of the work of the Belgian-based performance artist Chris Vadonk, who is a, a, a visual artist and performance maker. And for many years, Marianne van Kirkhoven was his dramaturg. Now, Marianne passed away about uh, three years ago now, and he has a, another dra dra uh, dramaturg named Christoph van Baal taking over. But many of the key works and many of the key ideas that uh, Chris developed in relation to a dramaturgy of things were done in conversation with Marianne, and so there's a really strong sense of dialogue. This is an image of a work uh, of Chris's called End, which attempts to stage the apocalypse in uh, a series of five or six scenes. Uh, the, the work lasts for approximately 60 minutes, and uh, I can't remember whether there are five or six performers who walk across the stage from left to right uh, in a random order and perform a singular task, each of which is designed to show some or communicate some experience of the end times. One person's falling from the sky, another person's dragging a body bag, another person's walking across the stage reciting uh, a, a sort of um, a, a, a stitching together of texts from all of the dystopian sources you could possibly imagine, um, from Cormac McCarthy to the Bible, uh, and of course lots of Samuel Beckett. Um, it's, uh, it's a remarkable work because ultimately this work is a work that is a performance of objects and things as much as it is of, of humans and text. And all of these things work in, in close concert with each other and give us this very layered, very detailed <coughs> sense of uh, what Chris would call an uncanny experience. And most of his work is, uh, as he says, designed to explore the uncanny and to provoke some kind of discomfort in the audience, and he sees this as a very important political thing. Uh, but this idea of discomfort, I think, can be expressed most, most clearly or most carefully through some kind of atmospheric projection into the space. Next, uh, next slide, but we'll skip it and go to the next one. Um, so Chris's early works were uh, object-based performances where people were encased in glass tanks wearing uh, scuba diving gear so that the audience could view these, work, these bodies, these objects, these figures, as he calls them, in absolute close detail. Um, and then, uh, next slide please, in Exote, he explores the uncanny power of nature as a, as a kind of performative experience. This was a work installed in an art gallery where there were three uh, invasive uh, uh, species of fauna and three of flora introduced into the, the gallery space and over the three month period uh, uh, they invaded and took over what was a garden and, 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 and uh, animal environment of indigenous plants and animals from Belgium. And so you had the presence of these other, you had to get special permission from the authorities, we all had to wear uh, a scientific uh, kind of like coats with um, gloves and boots and goggles to go into the space. And there were a series of science-like doors to get in and out because, of course, these evasive species were not allowed to escape into the, the Belgian landscape because otherwise they would actually enact in, in reality what they were being performed, the, the performance of them was being done in the, in the um, space. Next slide, please. One of Chris's major works is um, uh, a work called Actor One, which is, it comes in three parts. The first part is the presentation of Mist, and just run that uh, 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 little movie very quickly. In, in the first part of this piece, we essentially watch an atmosphere as a performance. The atmosphere is acting. 
according to Chris's uh, terminology, and it makes uh, a very strange effect. There's a very subliminal music track underneath it. There's a sense that one wants to immerse themselves in the smoke, uh, and this is a very carefully controlled environment, which is very theatricalized because it's a stage with uh, various lighting and uh, and um, uh, wind effects that that produce this very uncanny atmosphere. Uh, the second part, which uh, is called uh, Humanid, is a is a third sized um, uh, virtual reality figure of an actor reciting a Beckett text, and it's extremely realistic detail. And it's a, a three-dimensional projection onto, uh, I won't go into how it's done, but essentially one is confronted with a very, very lifelike miniature version of the actor reciting a Beckett text about being small. And, uh, and it's, um, uh, it, of course, this is the, the, the theatre part where the great modernist playwright is having his text recited by this virtual reality figure. And then in the third part of the performance, which is we're moving through a theatre, an actual theatre, um, we meet uh, the Dancer 3, which is a jumping robot, uh, which um, uh, many people become quite uh, transfixed by and, and feel empathy for. This is a, a, a performance of futility and failure. The robot bounces up and down on its single pogo leg and... Uh, and inevitably it falls over, only to be pulled up by the machine that is, uh, it's attached to and it, and it re-performs its, its task. And, and we project all sorts of drama onto this. We want it to perform, it seems to perform better, it seems to perform, uh, it seems to respond to our desire for it to perform with a great energy and detail. And Chris informs me that much of the secret of this work is that he actually sampled R2-D2 from the first Star Wars movie as the voice of the, of the Dancer 3. And everybody of a certain age is very nostalgic for that uh, sound. And so there's a high degree of empathy for the piece around there. So moving on, just skipping the next slides and going right to um, the final slide in the package there. Um, I think uh, we come back to this question of the dramaturgy of things that uh, Van Kirkhoven talks about. And, um, and you know, with, with so much live work now crossing into the world of objects and things, which is called Vibrant Matter by Jane Bennett, we can say that theatre is entering new territories and about thinking of, uh, about the way in which we are all connected to objects, atmospheres and transforming realities. This is what we aim to name in our, uh, in our phrase, new media dramaturgy. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Maybe take the microphone since we are. Um, it's in a dramaturgy series that's edited by Kathy, Burner, uh, Kathy Turner and Cinna Burnt. Uh, and unfortunately, that's an academic series and the books are quite expensive. So um, get the library to buy it, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe first comments to the presentation or from your colleagues or. I, <coughs> I was thinking what is the red thread through our three very different uh, presentations. And I was thinking about that perhaps it's uh, the soft narrative. So wh what Peter was telling about this robot performing a dance and, and the, the audience members projecting feelings and a story into it. And this is, this is certainly what we humans are wired to do that you, you see events uh, in time and, and you, you begin to create a story in your head about it. And these can be very abstract things that you see, see a pattern, and you begin to create this soft narrative understanding. And I think that this was the red thread in the three presentations we just heard.
Yeah. Oh, this, I, I guess this goes to the heart of what I've been uh, talking about for quite a long time, and uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but uh, I'm very much in favour of a notion of expanded dramaturgy, a notion of taking the, 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 the understanding of dramaturgy that we have in the theatre, which is essentially an understanding about how ideas and experiences are structurally or materially represented on the stage, how they're organised. So, in other words, it's a bridging between idea and practice and how we can apply this idea not only to the world of theatre but also to the world of performance, to curatorship and more broadly into other social and political spheres. Uh, I think I'm interested in this idea primarily because uh, it, it automatically takes us to an understanding of performance as uh, something that is um, invoking ideas. It's saying theatre must be about ideas, it must be about something. It can't just exist as a kind of entertainment or something. And that those ideas should be made explicit in, the, not only in the, in the language of the dialogue of the text, for example, of the work, but also structurally embedded into the forms. And so we see an argument about theatre, about the world, structurally embedded in the way that uh, the stage is organised dramaturgically. So that's my kind of link, I think, between them. Uh, no, I just wanted to mention one thing. If you haven't read her book, it's wonderful. And one of the terms that stood out for me was large-scale dramaturgy. So, and of course, inst it's part of institutional dramaturgy, but at least in my theater training and background, this is not something that we study to kind of look at large scale dramaturgical structures. We always just looked at either the play or the thing. And this, I mean, maybe it relates to this extended thing you were talking more outside of performance, but um, even within theater training institutions, I don't know that artists are kind of looking at the impact of large scale dramaturgy, institutional dramaturgy, um, and maybe these kinds of things can be brought into the conversation. We are back to Marion van Kerkhoven, who had this term macro dramaturgy, macro and micro dramaturgy, depending on the scale of, of, of the focus. So um, what we are talking about, if I understand right, is significantly uh, or mostly about an expanded idea of dramaturgy. The, quote unquote American dramaturg often is the literary manager and selects plays, which you know, he recommands what the artistic director does, he or she anyway what they want, and they just do some audience outreach. Meanwhile, the European idea of dramaturgy really was a deep engagement with the subject matter connected to history, uh, history of the theater, and also uh, in the current uh, social, uh, political or, or economical situation, but you were all saying in this expanded idea and the dramaturgy of things, of atmospheres, of uh, material representation on stage is actually almost like a new, a definition of, of the term itself? I just think that because dramaturgy is always responding to, to theatre practices, so the way the theatrical universe is expanding, obviously our dramaturgy is expanding, but um, it, this is not a dichotomy between old and new dramaturgy, it, it contains it all. And uh, when you mentioned European practices, I mean, I feel really humble that we have uh, the forefather of Amer American dramaturgy, Mark Bly, with us in the room. And he, he worked with uh, Livio Chule at the, at the Guthrie Theatre, uh, uh, creating wonderful dramaturgical practices and f fantastic performances. And Chule brought uh, his experience from uh, the Boulandra Theatre in Romania. And, and, and that attention to details and mise-en-scene. And, and Mark uh, and, and Michael Lupu, uh, they they transformed uh, theatrical research and 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 they were they were talking about uh, the relevance of the performance here and now so that 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 concept that that idea that notion that Peter was talking about that um, a performance is expressing um, those ideas that we, we can we can uh, we can talk about when, when we think about the the work at the Guthrie theater <laughs> Let's say we give uh, you a microphone, so we... Live streaming. <laughs> we, are, are we are live streaming? Oh, that puts the pressure on us all, doesn't it? Uh, um, thank you, Catalan. Um, 
I do want to say, though, uh, what every, the three of you just said is really quite thrilling. I've been watching on National Geographic Channel lately uh, the 10-part the series on Einstein. I don't know how many other people have been watching it, but a number of the things that you've all been talking about, particularly you, Peter, uh, it rem has reminded me a lot about that series and the whole notion uh, this has been a very liberating panel in a lot of ways, the way you've been talking about dramaturgy. Uh, dramaturgy as not just these things in a text, not just about actors on stage, not just about words in space, but ideas, objects, a whole series of things, events in space, events in time and space, you know, so that we are th liberated in this 21st century, I, I'd like to believe, about thinking about dramaturgy in whole new ways. Not one way, not two ways, not three ways, but that we're open in all sorts of ways to thinking about dramaturgy in spatial ways, in new time ways. And, and I think that's really exciting, just to, to hear the way that each of you are talking about it, curated ways, uh, uh, I love that, that idea, but, but the whole notion of dramaturgy as an event in space is uh, bumping into two things, uh, uh, I think is an exciting notion. Uh, you know, I think that you, you mentioned, you began by talking about the North American context and then bringing in this idea of an expanded dramaturgy. Um, the, the, you know, I, I developed many of these ideas working in the Australian context where really we began a conversation about dramaturgy in the late 1990s, early 2000s, because a group of us wanted a different kind of theatre. We, we'd been working in theatre for 10 or 15 years and um, myself, I'd been in the you know, Suzuki Tadashi kind of physical theatre stream and we wanted a theatre, we felt that the theatre was needed to be more complex it needed to have more uh, um, engagement with form and that form should be more meaningful. There was, uh, and I won't go into the historical complexity of that, but I think dramaturgy reappears at various times within particular theatre communities to provide something new that those theatre artists and those communities need because, in a sense, their, their, their community, their audiences and, and those, uh, that pra those practitioners need that kind of work. Now, when we come into, uh, say, the British or the American tradition, we've got very different contexts for the histor historical evolution of dramaturgy. The great thing about Australia is the theatre history is quite short, and so you can kind of reinvent it quite quickly. Um, not that we managed to reinvent it, and they're still making well-made plays, but um, uh, um, I think that, th that um, we're now starting to see even the, the, the text-based play transforms. So when I see Richard Maxwell transform his stage into uh, some, kind of media, uh, some kind of affective space, when Okada Toshiki's play seems to sort of run into, moves out of the dramatic register into uh, the performance art register where the stage just starts to melt, something's going on there about the way in which even artists who traditionally work with the text, which has traditionally been very much connected to this idea of literary dramaturgy, I, even that seems to have been changed into a more kind of what we might call a performance dramaturgy. And, and these things are becoming more mixed, and so I think that's really exciting. That's a very exciting, yeah, yeah. You know, I was just thinking about the audience because we haven't really talked about the audience, and I think one of the reasons that you're saying so excited is because there's so much, uh, happening around performance now. Performance is everywhere, museums, galleries, you know, but, but because we want to attract the live and the people and theater makers know how to handle the audience and storytelling is not just the event, but it's how the audience, you know, it's like when you see an exhibit, how does the audience, where do they enter, how long, how much time? Um, and I remember, I just want to point out that I remember, again, dramaturgy, the word or the thing was not mentioned, but I remember a long time ago I went to see a panel and Philip Bither from the Walker Art Center was talking 
And he, he was <laughs> explaining how difficult it is at the time trying to um, sometimes talk to the, the curators of the visual arts branch of the Walker because they, they didn't understand how to orchestrate audiences. They didn't understand that their job was event, eventing or eventfulness. And I think that whole, that his work, he didn't use the word dramaturging, or, but in a way it seems like how you approach audiences is part of this dramaturgical, large-scale approach. I just think that we think more and more about processes and, and, and the process not only involves what goes on stage, but what happens before the thing goes on stage or, or gets performed. And I have a question to Bertie, because uh, it was very interesting when you were talking about the, this portable concept, but you know, with some of our country's history of colonization, uh -huh. how, do, how do we do go about that these uh, <laughs> this is not a way of cultural colonization. Uh, um, so well, I think that's very uh, appropriate because appropriation, cultural appropriation, I think has been in the news a lot recently. And I, I, I wonder if they had dramaturgs in the curatorial departments, what would change. But um, the issue of portable concepts, I think, is totally linked to this cultural appropriation. How does one navigate as a curator um, you know, what you bring, how you present it, whose culture. There was a whole other issue with American realness and they had on the cover, I'm not sure how many people were following this, they had on the cover an image of a Native American and then, then Ben Pryor kind of had to, um, you know, do a whole evening just addressing that issue. But um, yeah, I think, I think the, the notion of being dramaturgically minded as a curator, I, I, and I'm neither, um, would, I'm just a researcher, um, <laughs> uh, would, 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 I think this is part of the conversation, portable concepts, cultural appropriation, how audiences see it, how other people are affected, but I'm sure other people have other comments. <laughs> Um, I just, I have to say that tonight's presentation is very exciting to me because one of the things I've been hearing from young dramaturgs recently, people who have currently training or recently training in MFA programs in dramaturgy, um, and Frank and I were talking about this just before this panel, um, the cost of MFA dramaturgy training is rising so precipitously as people's incomes, most of us, are going down, um, that in fact, and theater dramaturgy, as we all know, or practitioners, is a shrinking field. Um, so in fact, many young dramaturgs now are understanding that the areas of growth in the field of dramaturgy are theme park development, uh, video gaming, virtual reality, in which there is a tremendous hunger and need for dramaturgy. Their big crisis is storytelling. They have the technologies, they do not have the storytelling capabilities, and anyone in those fields will tell you that. So, in fact, for many young people who are graduating from dramaturgy programs now, no matter how conventional their training may be, in fact, the only way that they will pay off the cost of their education, their student loans, is by working in these new media fields. And yet, um, for the most part, their training is not preparing them for that, and the dramaturgy literature is not preparing them for that, because really what those fields are talking about is a dramaturgy of experience, um, not of the stage per se. And um, so I find this tremendously encouraging, A, because now this literature is beginning to appear, which means that eventually it may trickle its way down into the training programs, but whether or not it does, it means that it is available to young people who are thinking about extending dramaturgy into these, well, they're not all new media. I mean, theme park development is not a new thing, but it is a booming field um, of event dramaturgy and experience dramaturgy. 
So I, I find this very encouraging, and I attend very few panels or discussions of dramaturgy that even refer to these new fields in which many young people are, are heading. I thought, uh, there, I have a, a range of thoughts that I'm considering, but one of them was, um, I think it's um, Boana Kunst who talks, who, use, who uses the verb stumble, and the dramaturg is one of the first to stumble, and so what happened today, Bertie, especially with your presentation was that you were stumbling upon dramaturgy, and that I think is what we who are dramaturgs do best, is that we put ourselves forward to stumble. Um, uh, and what that does for our field is takes away this uh, idea of, of an expert and opens it up to an ability for collaboration to happen. And it places the dramaturg uh, as an artist in the room. So that was something exciting to see today. And then the other thing I've been thinking about, um, within the field of dramaturgy, there have been metaphors that have been used often. And one of them has been um, a, a shifting baseline or uh, the dramaturgy happens um, at um, fault lines, um, and it's and that's and then recently uh, reading a lot about dance dramaturgy, I have a, a another new metaphor which is of the cloud and accumulation, and um, which Peter I started to see within your presentation today, and so thinking about the, an evolution of metaphor from the fault line to the cloud and accumulation. Um, uh, which becomes productive for us within the field, uh, all of which is to say that we've gotten to a place now where we are actually talking about the doing of dramaturgy rather than the what of it. So tonight is really exciting. Okay. Um, First of all, I'm one of the newest students, and one of, of drama, the new dramaturge. And um, I took the advantage of ushering just now, and I read quickly, you know, <laughs> some of the pages in your book. And I was wondering then um, what you call institutional dramaturge, because you mentioned to like lessing, like sort of opened up the way, and you called in that book John Cobbing in America as like you know one of the first, and then we have Mark Bly here, <laughs> that you call the father of American dramaturge. So my question would be, I mean, my training is mainly in um, criticism of dramatic literature. So if you call Lessing and John Cobbing as drama critics, part of institutional dramaturge. How could we distinguish dramaturge today and we as critics of dramatic literature or even theatrical performances? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think, well, obviously this is a a profession uh, that evolved in 250 years. In fact, this is, this is it, the 250th anniversary of the establishment of the Hamburg National Theatre. But obviously, as well, theatre has changed a lot, uh, people and societies. So I think institutional, obviously, for the reasons of my organizing the book, I had to simplify things. Uh, that's why I came up with the idea of institutional dramaturgs and, and curating, so dramaturgs based at a theater or a festival, thinking about the macro dramaturgy of that organization and institution beyond one performance. And yes, in a way, uh, the move is when, when the theater critic moves into the building, because Lessing worked as a critic, however, he was an amazing playwright. He was a star playwright of his times. He was uh, kind of the Mark Ravenhill of, of uh, uh, the late 18th century uh, Hamburg, and, and, and the, the theater uh, was very clever to invite him to be on board when launching. Uh, uh, their endeavor of establishing a national theater 
in, in this very rich uh, port town in uh, Hamburg. Um, so what I'm saying is that when you have uh, that critical perspective becoming part of the theater making process, that's the birth of, of, of dramaturgy and, uh, and, and the beginning of institutional dramaturgy. It's interesting that for me, the involvement of, of dramaturgy is very political. So with Lessing, we have, we have the, the aim for creating a national theater, producing new drama uh, on the mother tongue, in the mother tongue, in a country that, well, well, there is no Germany, then there are separate various principalities, and we are talking about a nation, a national theater, and, 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 and not performing in a uh, French place, but performing new German place. So that's a political act, a very, very strong political act. And then jump ahead to the 20th century, we've got Brecht, Bertolt Brecht, and the and, and, and production dramaturgy, when, when taking a play, uh, using a play as, as, as raw material uh, for the performance and, and for the idea that you'd like to express uh, through this performance. And that's another very, very political act um, to express uh, your idea about here and there through the mise-en-scene. And then jump ahead to these collaborative processes of new dramaturgy. And that's a very, very political act, uh, working in collaboration. I, I think in, in recent days, theater and the theater making process is one of the few places where you can still find true democracy. And, and I think we need to maintain and nurture that uh, uh, democracy. So that's a very, very political act again. So this is just in, in brief the evolution of, of, of dramaturgy as a, as a political act. You, you sort of admitted what the dramaturgy wants to do is to control the audience's appreciation of what's going on in the performance, this kind of control. I, I think you'd look at the, the introduction of Ibsen to America in England. You had your playwright Shaw making his efforts, Granville Barker, the actor manager doing it, George Brandy's the critic. They gotta set up the audience so that they can get the reaction that's required to appreciate uh, Ibsen, same thing with Brecht, you have your Eric Bentleys, you have your other people. Again, this is in other words a drama dramaturgic rich moment when they have to make sure that a chaotic audience whose own traditions like America and Britain too is, you don't know until the moment the play ends whether it's a hit or it's a failure or a flop, that kind of anxiety of terror that we all in a sense grow up with on that angle Whereas in the Germanic world, they preferred not to have that, to have the more guaranteed preparation. And I think that the dramaturge rich environments that you're describing are really, they're seeking to do that. That's what the goal is, one of the goals anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I'm interested in when we can misread audiences too, because we can try and address audience desire or concern and, and actually, if you work in a more commercial sphere, I think the challenges are even higher, but so often we fail at that <laughs> uh, because audiences are very unpredictable and they'll see what they want to see in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an event. Um, but I, but I, and the other thing is that a lot of the work in new dramaturgy is specifically open in its reading. It, it specifically opens up the text to multiple readings, and I think... Um, much to the consternation of, of some critics sometimes, but uh, there is this emphasis on uh, a more participation, more mobility of the text or more mobility of the play to be received in different ways now. And that's also very dramaturgical, uh, perhaps an opposite kind of dramaturgical strategy to the, uh, the Lessing strategy, which is to try and make a well-made play. And many times now we see artists who intentionally actually try and pick apart that kind of structural model and do something different precisely to leave questions and leave possibilities for interventions by the audience. So. Uh, Peter, a question for you. You worked with Christopher Dunk, I think, on Rumor. Uh, that Was it called Rumor, the piece? Uh, it wasn't called Rumor, no. Uh, um, which one was the video, was the group of eight, nine? 
Oh, yes. Um, yeah, uh, that's just... It's, um, yeah, it's gossip, it, gossip. Oh, gossip, right, yeah. gossip. So, uh, but tell us, yeah. so, so you mm. work, so what, else, what did you do in the room, in the space? How did you shape? What was different if you wouldn't have been there? What, how, did, how did a collaboration look like in this so idea of new... Gossip is a video artwork that Chris made, which is um, uh, a, a work that is about... Um, essentially, the, the inspiration for the work is uh, the, the discussion about refugees and cultural difference within uh, Belgium, even though it's a... A society that is divided along French and Flemish lines. There's a lot of discussion about outsiders, and um, so he created a work where uh, he, he created figures, archetypal Belgian figures, people of, of um, different uh, sizes and different ages and different genders, and and using um, video, uh, very kind of video compression, uh, he made them all. Uh, appear in, in exactly the same size. So a young, small person was exactly the same size as a tall, old person. And they were all kind of squashed together in this impressive, uh, overwhelming video. And then they, they all spoke uh, their gossip about the neighbours. Um, oh, they, you know, they, they don't put out their milk bottles. They don't do this, they don't do that. And they all spoke at the same time. So the gossip is a cacophony of sound. And um, the, the viewing is that we, um, we experience this a kind of a, a humorous, but he says a very distorted uh, version of xenophobia where uh, there's this kind of obsession with difference, but everybody ends up the same and squashed into these little boxes. Um, I didn't work on the show as a dramaturg. I, uh, I guess, co-produced the show in, in, in Sydney um, when we invited Chris as part of our project to come and, and work with us. Um, and he, he came and did a workshop with artists. We brought him there to workshop with, with Australian artists. But we, we also worked with the performance space and we produced that work as, as, as a way of showing his work um, in, in some format. We couldn't afford to bring end, <laughs> although we'd love to bring that. Um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting question because staging the work it becomes a set of technical issues. It's a work with multiple projectors, so it's about getting the, the balance of the projections right so that you have this seamless uh, presentation. And, uh, it's, a, it's a work that the sound is very important. So ultimately, when you actually get to the level of, of, of the work arriving in the space, all of the questions are technical. Um, and I in a way, all of that thinking about the, the work, the, the artistic structure of the work is all is all already finished by the time it gets there. Now that's that's a very different experience to bringing a live work into a space where you're having to probably remake the work quite considerably. I've been involved in touring shows quite often where you have to really re-dramaturg a work according to a new space. But with the video work, the, the dramaturgy is more technical. <laughs> um, uh, you have to fit the image into the space. You have to make the data projectors work in the same way, it's, it, it, data projectors have very different um, brightnesses depending on the age of the, the bulb in them. So the, Chris was obsessed with this. This drove us to distraction. The, he had uh, you know, um, the technician up and down the ladders constantly. So for him, in the end, it was about uh, making sure that the presentation was exact. Yeah. Um, this is a question we are so often asked. And one of the reasons I curated uh, the two films about Pinabashi's working process is to show you that the work is so subtle. So if you expected something sensational, you were probably disappointed. This is, uh, this is not Pina by Wim Wenders. This is about all those little nuances and, and, and the subtlety of the work. That's why it's really, really difficult to pinpoint it. Um, I think it's easier to pinpoint if I didn't do my work well. But again, we have Mark in the room, and, and when, who, who has a very famous quote, because he too was asked this question, and I will par paraphrase it, but Mark answered that, I can't show you what I did in this production, but if you would poke it, it would bleed me. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, 
thinking about the, the chronology of dramaturgy and the dramaturgy that you've given Catalin, but also thinking about new dramaturgy and perhaps a historical lineage that we need to go back to that's f further back than where we're applying to it now. Like I think of uh, Adolf Appia and his work with Dal Cruz. I think of um, uh, Anna Halpern and her husband who was an architect who very much influenced her artistic process. The, um, and, and the obvious one is always, you know, Cage and Cunningham. Um, so when we're talking about new dramaturgy, which are, um, which is forms coming into the room and communicating with each other, um, that where we are now actually has existed and probably existed prior to us uh, applying the word dramaturgy to it and um, wondering about um, your, uh, your ideas of, of new dramaturgy and whether that, um, what that terminology does for us now or whether it's productive to put tension to that to um, expose a, a process um, uh, and a collaboration that's been happening for quite some time. Um, the short answer is that it's a dialogue relationship and you are not necessarily even have to be called as a dramaturg to have that dialogue relationship. And, and you can see many device productions where th there's this dialogue relationship is happening without even a, somebody labeled as a dramaturg being, being on board. Um, what was the second half of the question, sorry? Um, is new dramaturgy new, I think? That's another question that is <laughs> very, very often asked. It's, again, Marianne van Kerkhoven, when they had this famous conference in the 90s, uh, I think it was in Amsterdam, um, she just, this was a realization that we had no terminology to, do, to those uh, performances, to those uh, things that you couldn't describe with the, uh, traditional dramaturgy with Aristotelian dramaturgy. So it was like, okay, let's let's call it <laughs> new dramaturgy. But again, this is this is not a dichotomy. It was just kind of a realization that we ran out of uh, a vocabulary at that point, and we had to expand our vocabulary to deal with with uh, with those occurrences, those performances around us that reached a critical level and, and we couldn't describe only in, in negative terms that this it doesn't have a story in it or this is not like that or it doesn't have a don't know, proper beginning, middle and end. Um, so I think it, it was a kind of cry for help but, um, or a, an acknowledgement of, of that lack. But I th since then, um, I think uh, many of my colleagues and many scholars worked on filling uh, that gap. I, in fact, Marianne van Kerkhoven, they, they uh, published a, a glossary of, of, of new terms. So we, we, are, we are catching up with the practices, I hope. No, I'm just gonna push it out there, but like, what about like somebody like, if you, if you think interdisciplinary really that way, but what about like Tino Segal? Is he doing dramaturgy? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe maybe the concept of, of this new dramaturgy is uh, when when visual artists are now conceptualizing performance in new spaces, they're just doing new dramaturgy. They just took it away before we. I mean, I'm, again, but I don't know. It's to think about. I'm also thinking about um, when uh, Nato Thompson from Creative Time produced. Uh, waiting for Godot in New Orleans, and Paul Chan took all the credit, and the director, uh, Chris McElrin, who we had here at the Martin Siegel uh, for, for, for a plenary with, with Nato, um, Paul Chan, and Chris McElrin, who directed it, and I remember Chris said, I, I usually don't do panels with them because it's not considered the artist of the work. So I'm wondering, what, well, what, was Paul Chan the dramaturg? I don't know, you know, yeah. Now, in retrospect, I had an exa like he kind of conceived the play and um, 
I don't know. I'm just wondering how this kind of interdisciplinary lens where now performance and theater is occurring again, like you said, that's this eventness kind of 21st century, like where, um, what, you know, how we can claim back new dramaturgy by calling back. Or for, for me, dramaturgy is just reminding us that all of these relations exist and are tangible and actually determine the outcomes of the work. They're part of the process. And it's a way of naming processes. So, you know, t but perhaps Tino Segal's work doesn't make sense unless you understand, at least from my perspective, unless it, it's speaking about dramaturgy in so many ways because it's a rem reminding us of, uh, of either the presence or absence of certain artistic processes in a very overt way. One there and then there's one. Year, years ago, I worked with Joanne Acolytus at the Guthrie on uh, a production of Buchner's very political fairy tale, Leonce and Lena. Uh, and it had Don Cheadle in it, Jesse Borrego, an amazing, amazing production. Of course, it was Don Cheadle before he was Don Cheadle. Uh, Years, we worked for 10, 12 weeks on it in, in rehearsal. Uh, it was set in the future, in the distant 21st century in the Southwest. Uh, there was a movie in it that uh, Leon, Leon's had created, his own home movie. He was the son of an international business tycoon, sort of a Trump-esque figure. And it was based on Lenz, uh, uh, Buchner's own novel. And uh, he was an Artaud-like figure. In the end, this was, a, and there were all sorts of dances, Texas-style dances on stage happening, country-western music. And, uh, Later, the assistant director, Debbie Savitz, decided to write a book about it. She went around and did interviews with all the actors. It took her four years to do this book. And at one point, she tried to describe the process, and she finally said to me, what, what, what do you think that was, what was going on on stage? All those actors, every day we started with an hour-long dance session, and she said, how did they keep from bumping into each other? And I said, it was because at a certain point, they realized they were not in a play, but they were an event in space. And, and so it was, no, it was, as you say, it was an absence of something else. The stage event behaved in a different way, and there was a different vocabulary that we evolved, and, and it, was, it was different. It was just different. And I think that's, I think that's the thing. The, uh, uh, to call it a new dramaturgy, I was the dramaturg, but I, I didn't call it a new dramaturgy. I, 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 I wouldn't have had the sense to do that. I was too busy working, <laughs> and so. Maybe one more um, over there. Okay. Uh, as you speak, it makes me think um, about a difference in uh, dramaturgy, the logic often being story and linear and narrative, and these experiences that are often more conceptual in, um, in construction and uh, how they're um, analyzing the structures, and wondering how you um, perceive artists um, or professors or others uh, nurturing uh, I think a more conceptual approach or application of of, uh, of dramaturgy, uh, I guess, uh, encouragement of conceptual thinking. How do you see that happening? <laughs> I was part of a group of people who set up an MA in dramaturgy at the Victoria College of the Arts in Australia and we began thinking, oh, this is so easy. All we have to do is teach theatre history and visual arts history and film theory and dance theory and, um, <laughs> and cultural studies and, uh, <laughs> um, and 
then you know th then there is the cradle from which the new dramaturg will will be born. But in fact, um, uh, it is a very difficult question. Um, uh, difficult because that's impossible within you know one subject to teach all that. It's also difficult because I don't know. This is a much more less philosophical answer, but. Uh, so many of the training programs teach for the, uh, the, the jobs that exist and not the jobs that could exist um, because people are paying a lot of money. So they're, they're teaching for a theatre that exists rather than one that is not yet quite realised in a, in a way that uh, we might want it to be. Um, uh, you know, um, it's an endless question, I think, that... Uh, um, I don't know, um, but one that we should always revisit. Um, I think we, we, we are a bit over time and we maybe wanted to ask you to, uh, to, to read a bit from the book, but uh, if I uh, uh, summarize maybe a little bit the idea, Hans Tieslehmann's idea of the post-traumatic theater, which perhaps doesn't cover um, um, what contemporary theater is about, but his big uh, Plato year was to say next to text is light and movement and the atmosphere and sound and the dramaturgy of projection. Um, so also the dramaturgs maybe then just upgraded also the bar. So yet actually we have to take it as serious as the written word and we have to engage with the sound and light and the atmosphere and how people get in, how the audience reception takes place uh, on the very same level as uh, we intensely uh, engage um, with, uh, with the text. And I think this really offers us this kind of new or modern dramaturgy or perhaps a framework to think new about theater and uh, to cover a lot what, what is very different than 20, 15 years ago. So um, you said you might have perhaps one, one, uh, one okay. part of the book you would like to yeah. uh, read, but if you want to say something, uh, of course. Just a very, very evening. quick response to Amy. Yeah. Um, I can only answer it with a metaphor. Uh, this is <laughs> a very, very tricky question. Well, first and foremost, I think we have to relinquish. Uh, I, I, I am relinquishing the idea. I don't know all the questions to all the answers, and the dramaturg is not the clever kid in the classroom. I think I think it, we, we are lulling us. This, this would be really, really silly to claim. Um, and if uh, Tim Mitchell says that dramaturgy is doing time, it's a nice metaphor. I really like it. I had two dramaturgs. I, I witnessed two of my dramaturg friends uh, having a serious argument whether dramaturgy is doing time or doing space. I think it's both. But as our understanding of time and space is changing and evolving, I think perhaps uh, this is how our understanding of dramaturgy is changing and, and evolving and will um, evolve in the future. And, and, and I think the key to dramaturgy is in, in its liveliness and in and its dynamics and, and room for this uh, evolvement and, and change. So the, the excerpt I brought is from the very, very end, uh, um, the conclusion. So I'm giving it away now. <laughs> um, it's uh, the two things about dramaturgy. Um, one day when economist and writer Glenn Whitman was having a drink in a bar in Los Angeles, he got into conversation with a stranger. When he revealed his job, his new acquaintance became very interested. Whitman recounts the ensuing conversation. Ah, oh, so what are the two things about economics? Ah, huh? I cleverly replied. You know, the two things. For every subject, there are really only two things you really need to know. Everything else is the application of those two things, or just not important. Ah, oh, I said. Okay. Uh, here are the two things about economics. One, incentives matter. Two, there's no such thing as a free lunch. The two things is more than just a funny game. It can be revealing. The good definitions are short and simple, yet somehow between them they capture the gist of the subject, not least through the dynamics between those two things. Ever since I heard about this game, I was intrigued to find out what the two things about dramaturgy might be. So here they are. Support and challenge. The order is important. 
support because that's why dramaturgs are called on board to support the director, the choreographer, the artist, the playwright, the concept, the production, the creative team, the company, the theater, the festival, the community around the company, the town where the organization is resident. Sometimes dramaturgs need to support one party only, but often it's more. Sometimes this means supporting people with conflicting interests. Watching and listening well is an art in itself. Describing vividly what we saw is one of the greatest skills of our profession. To know when it's time to intervene and when it is better to remain silent and leave the company to make gradually the discovery through a journey of trial and error requires artistic sensibility. However, simply reassuring people in their decisions is not enough. Our job is to help them to get as near to achieving their full potential as possible. And this takes me to my second thing, challenge. A positive challenge, questioning, igniting sparks, creating friction and constructive disagreements, pushing people to go beyond their comfort zone. A good dramaturg does both, supports and challenges, and knows which one of, the, of these two things to apply and when. This definition also reveals an important aspect of our work. This is a relationship, a dialogue, an interrelation between two or more people with the aim of creating or developing a piece of performing artwork. As a relationship, it is dynamic, supportive and challenging, and it progresses by way of positive questioning. This relationship can be formed between two individuals, a whole group, or between an individual and an organization. The crucial element is the participant's attitude towards each other. As a relationship, it is individual for each creative process, yet there are recognizable patterns in the work. As a professional relationship, it has certain constant constituents. It happens within the framework of the theater making process with its rules, written and unwritten ethos. Last page. Last page. Procedures, opportunities, and limitations. In order to fulfill this role, it requires sensibility, skills and knowledge, and a certain personal disposition. A dramaturg needs to bear in mind that although it is a creative role, it is always a secondary one. Our job is not to make decisions, but facilitate decisions and show the choices and implications of possible decisions. <coughs> a dramaturg's mode is questioning, not statement. The dramaturg's role is to help the theatre makers through a succession of decisions to achieve their work. The dramaturg may well be part of the actual creative process, but at some point he or she has to become detached from it and withdraw, and this is a vital part of the process. Dichotomy is at the heart of the job of the dramaturg. Being inside and outside, the male and the female, Apollo and Dionysus, the creator and the recipient, seeing both the forest and the trees, supporting and challenging, being a personality with an individual taste but also able to suppress one's ego when necessary. The work of the dramaturg is often unpredictable. Dramaturg Ruth Little likens it to running headlong into a tornado, into the unknown, into danger and chaos, and not knowing what the result might be. The person in Francis Ice's tornado photo series might be a dramaturg, perhaps not in a de desert facing a tornado, but ready to throw oneself into the creative process and allowing an organic dynamics to unfold. The moment the picture was taken captures the moment of curiosity, being on the scene, yet outside of the action, observing it from a safe distance. It also shows trust, bravery, and of course the danger involved in the situation, being determined to immerse himself completely in it. There will be a moment when man and tornado will be one, and he will allow that to happen, learning its rules from within. Then, learning the rhythm, dynamics, and pattern of it, he will gradually gain control, break himself free at the other end. His hair and shirt may be disheveled. He will still breathe soundly. But I imagine he will look back again to take a final glance at, the, at that chaotic, dynamic, beautiful, and powerful complex 
he has experienced. Then he might carry on walking in the desert until he spots another corn swirling on the horizon. The landscape is yours. Find your own path across it. Good luck. Enjoy. <laughs>